Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's program titled How the Northern District of Illinois is Coping with the COVID Crisis. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web webinar presentation, you are encouraged to, to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Barry Fields. You may begin, Barry. Thank you. Uh, my name is Barry Fields. I'm a litigation partner at Dallas, and I'm currently in the Chicago chapter of the Federal Bar Association. The Chicago chapter is proud to sponsor this important webinar, which is focusing on how the Northern District of Illinois is coping with the COVID-19 global pandemic. Uh, we would like to thank Safar Shaw for graciously agreeing to host this seminar on its technology platform. As you may know, the Federal Bar Association is dedicated to promoting uh, the welfare, interest, education, and professional development of attorneys involved in practicing in the federal court system. It has more than 19,000 members, including 1,500 judges, and its members run uh, the spectrum of federal practice from small to large firms, corporations, and federal agencies. The Chicago chapter is one of the largest chapters in the Federal Bar Association, and in normal times, we offer numerous in-person seminars featuring federal judges and esteemed practitioners advise, uh, providing advice on how to effectively practice in the federal court system. If you're not a member of the Federal Bar Association, we hope you will consider joining. Uh, you can visit the chapter's website or the website for National FBA to explore the benefits of joining. Needless to say, the, the world has changed dramatically over the past several months. We know that the global uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, has thus far killed um, 140,000 or more than 140,000 people. Uh, in the world, including more than 33,000 in the United States. Uh, there are more than 2 million uh, confirmed cases of corona coronavirus uh, in the uh, world and more than 600,000 and nearly 700,000 uh, in the United States. We know that millions of people have lost their jobs. Uh, many people are obviously food insecure. And our thoughts and prayers are, are with those who've been negatively affected by this pandemic. We know that the SARS coronavirus 2 will be with us for the foreseeable future. Uh, our, our court systems, our justice system, cannot close down, and cases cannot remain stayed for, the, for months on end. Uh, the courts have to adapt to the day-to-day -day circumstances, and so the purpose of this webinar is to get an understanding of how our local court, the Northern District of Illinois, is coping with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, before introducing the panel today, one housekeeping matter. Uh, after the event, you will receive an evaluation form. You should uh, complete that evaluation form, return it, and within a few weeks, you should receive an, a CLE certificate. Uh, we are very grateful uh, that our panelists have agreed to participate uh, in this important webinar. And let me introduce the panelists before I turn it over to Judge, Chief Judge Paul Meyer. Uh, the first panelist is Thomas Bruton. Uh, Mr. Bruton became uh, the clerk of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois in January 2012. He is the 14th person to hold the position in the court's 200-year history. He's responsible for overseeing the administration and operation of the Northern District of Illinois, which is one of the largest federal district courts uh, in the United States. Uh, Judge Robert Dow Jr. is a graduate of the Harvard University Law School. He worked as a judicial clerk for Judge uh, Flom on the uh, Seventh Circuit before joining Mayor Brown, where he worked mainly as an appellate lawyer. He has served as a district judge in the Northern District since December 2007. In addition, since 2013, he has been a member of the Judicial Conference's Advisory Committee on the Civil Rules. Chief Judge Rebecca Paul Meyer is a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. Following law school, she worked as a judicial clerk for Judge Rosalie Wall of the Minnesota Supreme Court. Her career has included uh, work as a judge for the Illinois Human Rights Commission and as a magistrate judge on the Northern District of Illinois. Uh, she became the, a district court judge in 1998. Uh, as you may know, in July 2020, 
Uh, she became the chief judge of the Northern District of Illinois, succeeding Judge Ruben Castillo. And as you also likely know, Judge Paul Meyer is the first woman to serve as chief, chief judge in the 200-year history of the Northern District of Illinois. So with that, I'll turn the panel over to, um, to Judge Paul Meyer. Thank you, Barry. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope all of you are somewhere safe and that you're healthy and that your your cares and worries are is as small as at least as mine are right now. Um, I'm 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 comfortable and I'm safe, and I have a terrific staff working with me. And you're about to hear from the chief member of that staff in a moment, our our clerk. Um, I just want to begin by pointing out that the court is not closed. We are not closed. We are operating. The building itself is not locked, but we are operating on an emergency status pursuant to plans that the court puts in place. Courts nationwide have plans for what are called continuing operations, operations that would continue in the event of, say, a natural disaster like Katrina or an explosion or a hurricane, something that puts the building and the court out of commission briefly. As you can imagine, what would ordinarily happen in circumstances like this is that we would move our operations to another facility and continue. That is not what we're facing right now because every court in the nation is currently under extreme circumstances because of the COVID crisis. It isn't simple for us to simply move our operation to another building. Those other courthouses have the same concerns that we have. And that makes a difference at the, about how our, our program, our emergency program operates. I have several judges working with me as emergency judges. We're handling all the emergencies that get filed in both civil and criminal matters. We hear those, uh, those matters typically by telephone or video conference from a courtroom in the building. Um, we have been able, with that mechanism, to manage and handle a number of motions that have come up. Not everything can be handled this way, obviously, and you will see, I think, more and more of us, myself, um, my colleagues that are part of the emergency team, but also the judges across the court handling things in writing that perhaps, you know, two or three months ago we would have simply ruled on from the bench or, or handled orally. But I'd like to begin by um, asking Tom Bruton to explain what our court has been doing so you get a sense of what the activity has been for those of you who think that it's the, that, that, there, that, a, that a slumber has taken place. I think you'll find that the situation is actually quite different from the standpoint of the numbers. So, Tom, perhaps you can explain what, what we've been doing and what the numbers show about the court's activities in the last several weeks. Sure, Judge. And just um, just to pause and, and to give my well wishes to everyone on, on the call, um, you know, our top priority first is to keep everyone safe and healthy, including um, those that uh, appear before um, the court and you know and the staff and so those that know me on the call and I've, I've talked to quite a few attorneys that have called and uh, over the past few weeks I um, know that I'm a, a numbers person so over the past few days I pulled a number of statistics um, to demonstrate the amount of work that has continued even though um, we're operating differently and as Judge Paul Meyer have said um, we in these uncertain times uh, we are um, we are still open um, but we are operating differently um, so since March 18th and that's kind of my marker that things the date that things significantly changed um, in the Chicago area and in the Northern District of Illinois um, so March 18th is kind of my marker day um, we've had um, a, a great amount of work accomplished and when I say that, um, 531 new civil cases, I'm sorry, 531 civil cases have been closed. 570 new cases have been opened. 14,064 docket entries have been made by court staff. Now that does not count um, the automated docketing that was done of the 20,000 entries of those um, general orders that were put out um, that that gave the instructions to all the parties um, of how things were going to be handled during these times, um, general order 20-0012. Um, so besides the 20,000 automated entries that were made, 
There were 14,064 docket entries made since March the 18th. Um, in addition, attorneys have made uh, 2,188 new motions that date. So that was 2,188 new motions filed. So um, we have been busy. Um, now, are those filings down? Absolutely. Um, but each and every day, emergency court um, proceedings have taken place, as Judge Paul Meyer alluded to. One emergency judge is in um, in the courthouse and handling proceedings. And those are, are being handled, and I think we'll talk about those uh, a little bit more later. All right, thanks. Um, we we have a number of questions that many of you have, have presented to us ahead of time, and I know some of you will be presenting questions on this webinar, but I, I would like to begin um, with the first question that was presented to us, which, which relates to the timelines and the Northern District order that extends dates to, um, from what they would have been under the federal rules. Um, the, there was a question about what happens with respect to notices for deposition, uh, when an individual inserts a reasonable date, does the current extension order automatically extend those listed dates? And, and Bob, why don't you comment on that, whether there is any, any one single answer we can give to that question? Sure. Uh, so uh, I guess let me start by saying um, in the general order, we tried to think around every corner. And uh, you can see from uh, the, the list of all the rules that we couldn't do anything about extending by statute, that we actually tried to be as thorough as we could be. But I think this question uh, exposes a, a gap, perhaps, because uh, there are some deadlines, as the questioner points out, that are really set by the parties without any uh, specific rule in the federal rules or anywhere else. So if you are noticing a deposition or you're uh, subpoenaing something, you put a date in there that I uh, presume that you think is reasonable. And I don't think it would be fair to say that the language of our general order covers those because it would not be um, within the local rules, the rules of civil procedure of the court. No one would have set a specific deadline there. Having said that, I guess I have two thoughts. One is the spirit of the rule certainly is that it was to extend all deadlines. And the, the, how you know that is that we spelled out the deadlines that we could not extend uh, by statute or rule and every other deadline was meant to be extended. Now, the good news, at least in my uh, experience as the emergency judge, and maybe uh, Chief Judge Paul Meyer has hopefully had the sim same experience and the other emergency judges have as well, we haven't seen any emergency motions fighting about what day uh, a deposition is going to take place or what day a subpoena is going to be answered. And so maybe it's true that the rule of reasonableness is applying here, because I think that would be the rule if what, an issue like this came to me. I would just say, well, the the spirit of the rule is to extend all the deadlines. And if you want to fight about a specific day, I'll just set a reasonable one. Um, but that's my experience. I don't know, Judge Palmer, if you've had a, a, the same experience. But uh, the good news is that no one seems to be fighting about this, even if it is a gap in our, our order. Uh, that's been my experience as well. We, I know my my staff has gotten calls to say, you know, what does it mean about this or what does it mean about that? And in general, I can answer by saying if it's a if it's a if it's a date set in the federal rules or in our local rules that is not a carved out in that general order that was entered on March 30th, then it's automatically extended. And I think Judge Dow is correct that the um, the dates set by the parties by agreement, you know, we didn't specifically address that, but in general, we expect parties to be as reasonable as they can be with one another under the circumstances. Um, we did get a number of questions along these lines and specifically relating to discovery and settlement issues and whether or not, um, for example, settlement conferences can continue during this time and whether virtual, how virtual discovery could be handled or should be handled. And we, we really don't have specific answers to some of these questions, but let me just back up for a moment and remind you of, of, of the reasons for the general order and and why I think those reasons have to be kept in mind when we talk about virtual discovery and settlement conferences and the like. Um, why did we enter this order in the first place? You, you recall that it was Friday the 13th of March that um, that the Governor Pritzker announced uh, kind of a, 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 
maybe it was maybe it was the mayor that day who announced that the schools would be closed. But once the schools close, we know we're facing a very difficult difficult situation for many many lawyers. Not all of us have children at home, but many do. To homeschool your kids suddenly is not something that can be done in five minutes every hour or in, you know, one portion of a morning. It's really a lot of work for people. And to say that you're going to be able to manage a full-time legal practice and continue with your discovery obligations and engage in settlement negotiations and file briefs at the same time is a challenge at best. We take the governor's order seriously. He wants us to stay at home, and I know that that's easier said than done for many people, but in general, it's very important for the health of our city and our nation that we stay out of the public and stop mixing it up with other people to the extent that we can. Um, I know that with respect to settlement conferences, it, it sounds like an easy thing for us to do that by telephone, or it sounds like a doable thing. And in some respects, yes, it is. But lawyers will tell us we need to meet face-to-face -face with our clients in order for this to be effective. Often it's important to meet face-to-face -face with a judge in order for a settlement conference to be effective. Um, to get authorization and signatures requires public contact. We know it is not simply that easy to say, let's pick up the phone and have a settlement conference with the court. Let me just make one further point about that. In, in many instances, a settlement conference ends with something being put on the record. That sounds like a simple thing, too, but it is more burdensome than one might expect because we in the courts share our, our, um, our telephone conference lines and our video conference lines with every other court in the nation. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we're not in a situation where we're just the courts in New Orleans that suddenly have to shut down. We are dealing with courts throughout the nation that have challenges Every bit is significant, if not more so than ours. So we really have to be sensitive to the need for those other courts to use the same facilities that we would like to get access to. And that can mean that if, 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 if something isn't urgent, we simply can't do it right now. Um, with respect to virtual discovery, there were questions along those lines and how the court might react to situations of delays because of a desire to take a deposition in person rather than in remote means. I think that I think the judges are likely to be very sensitive to that. So the reality that it, although sometimes video depositions work just fine when credibility is necessary or when a lot of ex documents need to be exchanged hands, that, that can be very difficult to do. So we would expect parties, and I think most of the time they have done this, we would expect parties to be as accommodating as they can to one another and not to press forward on the, under circumstances where it will really be difficult to do an effective job in getting in getting discovery done. Of course, it's possible, again, to exchange documents. It may very well be possible to, you know, answer inter interrogatories. And it there may be circumstances in which depositions are possible, too. But remember, the stay-at-home orders, the no-contact orders, the problem with of logistics, packaging things, getting things together, meeting with staff, those are problems that for right now are much more difficult than they might otherwise be. Um, so I, would, will, we, will we require virtual discovery or will we require remote depositions? There may be some judges who in some circumstances think that that's appropriate. I think in general, you're gonna find most of our judges will say, we're on pause right now. We know that's hard for the firms. They need the income to come in. We know that litigators need to need to stay busy. We understand that. But we also think our, you know, our first responsibility, I think my first responsibility is to do whatever I can for the safety and, and public health of um of not only the, the, the court and its staff, but the people who, who come every day and expose themselves to what goes on in our building. So that's that's our most important goal at this point is to keep everybody safe. I think we had a question about um, the next couple of questions related to telephone status conference and motion hearings. And um, Judge Dow, I think we're going to ask you to answer, tell us, since it looks as though our social distancing recommendations are going to continue at least for a while, do you expect that there will be more status conferences and motion hearings by telephone than, than we in our court are accustomed to? Well, I do actually, and I think it'll be interesting to see um, the extent to which this is um, really uh, sets a trend, not only in our courthouse, but around the country. And, and uh, I know that there are other districts where uh, telephone is the rule or ruling by mail is the rule too. And I know that our district uh, has a lot more 
in-person contact with lawyers. And I think most of us who are judges and I think lawyers as well in the district like that. Um, but in the short run, at least we'll have to do the best we can with what we got. My hope is that even if the social distancing rules are in place to some extent, they may be relaxed to some extent. The big problem we have right now uh, for having even phone hearings is, is staffing because we don't have uh, our courtroom deputies and our court reporters in the building. Um, if social distancing were relaxed to the point where you could, people could go to work, but you still wouldn't want a full courtroom for um, either a jury trial or for uh, uh, your typical status hearing where you might have, you know, 30, 50, 70, a hundred lawyers uh, in your courtroom, depending on how long your, your status is and what kind of cases are you're hearing that would be a good time maybe to do a lot of telephone statuses. And my own personal hope is that that will be May. Uh, it might be June. I mean, I, I think that I'll, those are matters that we'll have to attend to. But uh, based on the guidance that we get from the CDC and from the governor and the mayor. Uh, but I think um, my hope is that we will be able to at least uh, uh, get more people in the building so that we can staff the calls and, and court report them, uh, because I don't think you could really do that in any kind of volume if you didn't have a court reporter and a, and a courtroom deputy to manage the phone calls. Uh, so that's my hope, and we'll just have to see how it goes. Um, but as, as the social distancing experts say, it's not going to be like flipping a switch, so we're going to go from nobody in the courthouse to everybody in the courthouse. So it may be that telephone conferences are a good way station. Well, I think that's a that's a fair you know analysis of of what the future holds. You know, we we can think about this in a variety of ways. One of the things that we're going to need to do, Judge Dow's correct. There's no flipping a switch and and turning things back to the way they were in January. We're just not going to do that. We can ease things in. We can um, limit the numbers of people and the numbers of uh, matters that we hear at any given time. I think many of us would you know, routinely have five, 10, maybe 12 hearings set at the same time and just hear them one after another. Maybe we'll stop doing that, but still allow people to come to the courthouse more on a staggered basis. We may find ourselves in and, in and out of court all day long instead of just coming in for our motion call in the morning for a couple of hours. There are a variety of things that, that, that can change. The, the culture of our court has been something that, that we, we have really treasured, and that is the Face time with judges has often been uh, remarked on as something that our court does well. It isn't possible to do that in other courts. For example, if you're in the District of Montana, it makes no sense to travel five hours for a five or ten minute status conference. But we know that even in large urban courts, it isn't always the case that there's lots of face time with judges. There are large urban courts that have a tradition of ruling on paper much more than we do. We may have to make some changes. I hope those changes won't be forever. I do like, I personally love going into the courtroom and seeing people, and I and I hope that we'll be able to resume that practice at least, you know, in, in large part. And and it, it, again, it won't be like flipping a switch. It won't be immediate, but I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able gradually to return to the culture that we've all become comfortable and familiar with. But that will be subject to public health um, advice that we're getting and whether or not it really is truly a safe and effective way to handle uh, what we're doing and keep not only our people safe, but, but, the, but again, the safety of the people that enter the building. Um, we, ha we are doing more things, as you know, by telephone and video conference. And those hearings have been taking place in the building. Many of them relate to criminal proceedings where there are you know, some urgencies that don't always relate in the same way in civil cases. We, we got a question from in advance about uh, how those criminal proceedings are being conducted and how, how it's going. And I'm, and, and I'm going to ask our, our clerk, Mr. Bruton, to respond to that question because he has really been on the ground from the beginning on this and has been involved in, I think, pretty much every hearing we've conducted. So perhaps, Mr. Bruton, you can answer that question for us. So we've um, been able to set up uh, video conference and telephone conferencing equipment at each one of our um, pretrial detainee locations with the exception of one. Um, but the units are, we're utilizing secure video conferencing equipment uh, through through the judiciary's network. As Chief Judge Palmer noted, um, 
the judiciary has um, one national contract um, in order to keep um, the the proceedings secure. Um, we we do have one national contract, and we're utilizing that system. Uh, attorneys that are participating get a unique link emailed to them, and that that link comes through an email, and we test that their equipment prior to the proceeding uh, with our AV team. And then once um, the proceeding time starts, um, they are um, able to join um, whether it's the attorneys uh, or possibly an interpreter, um, we've we've needed that um, we've needed that through some of these proceedings. Um, they've joined both telephonically and um, through video conference. Um, and um, as Judge Palmeyer had talked about earlier, these resources are in really high demand around the country. And one of the one of the really limited resources that we've seen is video conferencing. And what we when we see that some part of the issue are um, individuals that are at home, their internet speeds. So we have seen a degradation of um, the quality. So we really have used utilized that on a limited basis and um, have utilized telephonic proceedings more than video conferencing. It also helps us, it's a faster setup, and during these emergency proceedings, we're able to get through to the prisons and the um, pretrial detainee locations much quicker, um, usually within about two hours, um, to get a hearing set up um, for a telephonic hearing where um, on an emergency basis, a video conference could take a half a day. Um, so we're able to um, get uh, more criminal proceedings scheduled uh, telephonically um, than we are video con with the video conference. Um, so um, that is, um, those are the national programs that we're utilizing um, here locally. All right, thanks. Um, we received a number of questions about Zoom. Um, Zoom, as you know, is only one platform. Uh, it, it's not the only platform for, for, video, uh, for video chats of various kinds. It has become very popular, uh, but that's not the only way that people can communicate by, by, uh, by way of uh, a, a, a video conference stream. Um, one question that we were asked in advance is whether uh, the court anticipates using video conferencing software, including, for example, Zoom, and whether that might be appropriate where credibility of witnesses is at issue. Is that something you can comment on for us, Judge Dow? Sure. Um, you know, I, I was on a Zoom meeting. Actually, the, the uh, Civil Rules Advisory Committee meeting was held by Zoom, and there were 50 people in their little boxes. And I actually thought it worked really well. Um, I wasn't trying to judge the credibility of any of the participants, though. And I think <laughs> that that it would only be a last resort in my way of thinking, at least and, uh, and, uh, if this were to go on for months and months and months, I guess I could conceive of, of finding that acceptable uh, as compared to a lengthy delay. But I don't think it's the same as having the lawyer uh, who's cross-examining you or the judge who's deciding your credibility actually um, staring at you. Um, I don't think it would be the same, but I, I think it's all going to be a question of um, competing interests being balanced because delay is a problem in some cases. And many of the, the proceedings that we've done um, have either been initial appearances or uh, sometimes they've been sentencing where um, a delay might lead in the, the lead to the defendant serving more time than, than anybody thinks is reasonable in a case. And I suppose at some point, if we were socially distanced for months and months and months for whatever reason, um, the delay in a case would be um, uh, a worse problem than having to do a second best way of judging credibility. So it could happen, but I'd, I'd be reluctant to do it at least until I'm 
uh, convinced that this is going to take longer than another month or two to get back to where we can have some in-court proceedings. And I should say, I have a my the next trial I have scheduled. I've already reset several jury trials for May. The next one I have scheduled is a civil case in June. And the parties sent me an email the other day asking, what did I think? And I, because the, the extensions under the general orders uh, extend their deadlines for filing a pretrial order and motions to eliminate proposed jury instructions basically through the trial date because it's June 8th. And I said to them, look, at the moment, we could have a trial on June 8th. We all should be prepared for the possibility that that may not happen consistent with the guidance we have from the authorities. But let's assume it does happen. My take on the general orders is that the default is they apply because I can't, I don't know anybody's individual circumstances. I don't know uh, how much imposition the COVID is placing on their individual lives. And, you know, they may be taking care of uh, children who aren't in school. They may be taking care of parents who are, can't get out of the house. They may be taking care of people who actually have the virus. But I said, if you all agree that you would prefer to keep your existing deadlines because you want this trial to go, um, then tell me you agree and I'll keep the deadlines as long as I can. But I, if, if, if the social distancing rules or other uh, uh, matters intrude, then I'll have to, to uh, uh, move them back. But I'll keep them. It's up to you guys, but you have to agree. If you don't agree, if this is inconvenient for anybody, in other words, then we're not going to do it. We're just going to default to the default. They got back to me and said, we've all agreed. We'd like to try to keep that trial date and we will, we will try to meet all the existing deadlines. And so I said, fine. Um, I think there will be a lot of cases where that happens. And I also think we're resetting a lot of criminal cases. Those take priority, especially if someone's in custody. So I could understand if you have a June 8th trial date and it gets kicked, you might not get another trial date till October if that judge has three criminal cases to be reset. So um, that's what I've done to handle this situation where, um, you know, delay might become more burdensome than the parties want. Um, so anyway, those are my, my thoughts, but I, I prefer not to do Zoom hearings unless um, unless uh, the delays are, are too onerous to, to uh, continue uh, the holding pattern we're in. I would just point out that there are security issues with Zoom hearings as well, and, and our administrative office of U.S. courts has has issued cautions about that. Um, it, you know, we've all seen the Zoom bomb phenomenon, and uh, it you know when we're talking about a, a court proceeding, it, it becomes that much more important to make sure that that what goes on is is secure and that we've got a, a record that's that's accurate and appropriate. We are considering the possibility of resuming with you know life as we once knew it, and, and that would include jury trials. Note that uh, our general order uh, presumes no trials until June, in part because we really can't summon jurors at the last second. We have to issue summons for juries about 30 days in advance. E even now, where you know people are pretty much home, they're entitled to some advance notice of when they're going to be called in for jury service. So the thought was that if we are back in action more or less in May, we would be able to summon jurors to come and appear in our courtrooms in June. Now, there are obviously, of course, social distancing issues that we need to consider and may need to consider all summer long. And that may affect how exactly and where we place jurors for deliberations and where we, how we bring them in and when we bring them in and how, how we, we, we staff the jury assembly room and the like. Um, so I, I want to ask uh, Tom Brute to comment on that question of when we do resume trials, what, how will the court address some of these issues to the extent that we've been able to think that through? So some of the th thoughts that we had was limiting um, the number of jurors that we would bring in uh, per day for void year, um, keeping in mind, you know, our jury assembly room at the Dirksen Courthouse is only so large and wanting, allowing jurors to social distance, uh, potential jurors to social distance, we want to keep be mindful of um, their spacing in the jury assembly room. You know, the, our, our culture here is to start most jury trials on a Monday. So we may need to to think about starting those uh, most jury trials on other days of the week, and as Judge Dow was saying earlier, maybe maybe uh, prioritizing criminal trials first uh, because of the backlog that we may see. The the other things that we've talked about is. Uh,
you know, uh, I know some of the questions that will have come up is, you know, the age 60 from the CDC, can you excuse all jurors um, or over the age of 60? While the Jury Act does not allow for that the way it's uh, written, um, you know, jurors over the age of 70 can ask to be excused. So those are things that we've been been talking about. Um, so we've we've been thinking those things uh, and projecting ahead when when we get back to to being able to have jury trials. All right, thanks. Um, we had a question, and I know we we're getting some questions online as well, and I, I hope we'll be able to reach some of those. One of the questions that that I I did want to comment on here, and I'll, I'll ask Judge Dow to do this again, is. Um, <laughs> Some someone wrote and said that a number of, law, of lawyers have been chastised by the federal judges for filing what are called emergency motions in situations that are, are non emergencies. And one of our own colleagues issued a, an order that got a lot of uh, national play on that. Um, and and the question is, can you provide? Can we provide you some guidance on what meets our definition of an emergency? Um, when I'm emergency judge, my staff jokes that uh, my my policy is people call and say they have an emergency, and I always say, ask them, is anybody bleeding? I mean, that's silly, and I don't mean to be flippant. I realize that there are genuine emergencies in the, in the commercial world as well. But I, I think it's important to, you know, to kind of have a sense of what we mean by that. And, and Judge Dow, do you want to comment on what you feel an emergency might really be? Sure. Well, I think one of the issues with um, uh, a judiciary where every one of the, I don't know, a thousand district judges are in their own silos is there's no real way to give you guidance as to how an emergency will be perceived by the assigned judge in any given case. Here's another bit of good news, though, based on, on my experience as one of the COOP judges, and, and Judge Palmer can uh, comment on this as well. But I know I'm guessing we've had something in the nature of 100 or 120 motions, maybe based on the docket. In the, in the emergency cases, maybe Tom knows the exact number of that, and very few of them do not meet my, my definition of emergency. Um, and it, there have been a few that I've come up on my emergency days where I have decided I didn't think they were an emergency. And what I've done is contact the assigned judge and say, this motion came in, I'm happy to handle it as the, as the emergency judge if you'd like me to. Um, I don't think it's urgent, and, and therefore I leave it up to you. Do you want to take it or do you want me to take it? Almost every single one of those, the assigned judges said, I agree with you, it's not an emergency. Set a briefing schedule and I'll roll on it. Um, so it, it hasn't been a grave imposition if people have, have uh, made a judgment call in their mind that it's not an emergency, and in my mind, or it is an emergency, in my mind it's not. But um, I think for the most part, to the lawyers in our district have been making the right call on that. And, um, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, you'd have to know the circumstance. I've had several TROs. I think every day I've been in, I've had TROs. Um, you know, if, if it's not an emergency, you're probably not getting a fast briefing schedule. If it is, you are. But it, again, it takes 15 minutes for me to figure that out. So I would just keep on doing what you're doing. And, and I'll just add, Judge Dow and Judge Palmeyer, that I carry the emergency phone that's listed in the um, in the general order. And when I'm asked, I think I have an emergency, or I'm not sure if I have an emergency, I refer them to the local rule that defines what an emergency is. And that's Local Rule 77.2. That's Paragraph 3. And that defines what an emergency matter is. And that's what I, I refer the attorneys to. And after they they look at that, I believe the attorneys can make an, an educated decision on if it if it justifies filing an emergency motion or not. All right, thanks. Um, one of the questions that came in online that I think we need to address it it's it's an important one. Uh, somebody, well, all of your questions are important. I don't want to suggest otherwise. A question was, is, is, is if hearings are, are being held telephonically via the Internet, is there some mechanism in place for members of the public or press to observe? And the answer is yes. When I say that our hearings are being conducted by, by telephone, I don't mean that they're not being conducted in the courthouse for public consumption. Anybody who wants to can enter the building 
and enter the courtroom where the hearing is, is conducted and can hear what's going on and to the extent there's video conference can see what's going on. Um, it, you, it won't surprise you that the building is nearly empty. And what that means is that social distancing is not a problem for a journalist or a member of the public who wants to be there. It's very simple to walk into the courtroom, sit in the back of the courtroom, and you're, you'll, you're, you're many, many more than six feet away from any participant. So it is possible for the public to observe everything that we're doing. There's nothing that, that prevents anybody from, from, uh, from access. And, and I think it's important to remember that we do understand our obligation to be available to the public and for what we do to go on in the light of, in, in sunlight, so that you're free to see what we're doing and, and, and hear the reasons that we're entering various orders. Um, another question that, uh, that came in that I, I, I thought might be worth mentioning uh, we were asked, well, what are the policies with respect to courtesy copies? And we do have a drop box in our lobby in our courthouse in Dirksen and also in the courthouse in Rockford, the, the courthouse out there. There are drop boxes and you can you can drop documents in there if you need to. There's no obligation to, to make uh, courtesy copies available. Um, and it's not possible to deliver courtesy copies to chambers. We're not permitting that at all. There's in many instances no staff to take them in. So that's just something for you to remember. Um, there are a variety of other questions here as well, and, and I'll and I'll just ask, I'll just mention a couple of them, and then perhaps you know ask for other comments from my my fellow panelists. One question was, how can an attorney ensure that his or her audio or video equipment is compatible with the court's equipment? That's a good question, and I think that's one that that Tom Bruton can answer for us because I know that he's been on the on the ground with that issue as well. Sure, Judge. Uh, for audio, it's just simply, um, you know, from the phone teleconference, it's just a simple phone. But for video, um, it, it's an email link that would work. And it, for that, it's a, you know, a computer with a video, a, a video, um, a camera, and a microphone. Um, and we test that in advance. And those are, have been used in very limited circumstances. Um, but Again, we test those and make sure that everyone has an opportunity to have um, a test run at it when we have um, utilized those um, a few hours before the hearing. So um, there is no specialized equipment. It's it's very um, simple to use, and the uh, clerk's office staff has been uh, great to work with. Her. All the attorneys have been involved to, to get them up and running. Okay, good. Now, I, as one of the emergency judges, can tell you that um, I, I think it's it's actually working well. Of course, there are glitches. It's not, you know, it, it's it's not smooth as silk. We have people drop out from time to time. Once in a while, we'll be in the middle of a hearing and suddenly somebody's connection fails. And, you know, this is another reason that, as I said at the outset, we recognize that for, to ask lawyers to simply seamlessly move into a into a remote practice and, and expect that everything's going to go perfectly. That's not realistic. Um, my own Wi-Fi here at my home drops off from time to time, and I, I can be in the middle of something and lose connection, and that does happen with some of our hearings. But in general, it has worked pretty well. In general, I think our, our staff has been good about jumping on the problem when something does go wrong. Um, what we've, many of our hearings have involved prisoners in, in the um, or detainees either in uh, at the MCC or in one of our contract facilities or other county facilities where some of our detainees are held. And they have equipment and are doing, um, I think, as, as good a job as they can in making in making people available for hearings and, and seeing to it that it works. That burden, though, as you can imagine, is one of the reasons that we're not doing as much as we, we'd per perhaps like to do in, in, in civil hearings. Um, in, in, in hearings in civil cases, uh, again, we're, we're, we'll, we'll do what we can. We, we're going to have uh, some some pressures when we do get back into action with respect to making sure that criminal trials governed by the by the Speedy Trial Act are are processed as quickly as possible. Uh, but but recognizing that there will be some there there will be some difficulties. Um, a variety of other questions have been asked. Um, one question was simply, what's the nuts and bolts of getting a, a hearing uh, scheduled? And, and let me just explain, we do have that that emergency docket that we've opened. It's 20C 1792. And if you file your motion as an emergency in that docket, we will see it within 
hours, within sometimes within minutes of it being filed. We'll make a determination, and you know, as Judge Dow indicated, is this an emergency? Is this something that needs a hearing right away? Is it something that we would think is urgent, but the presiding judge is likely to be available to handle it immediately? Or is it something where really the emergency judge needs to enter a briefing schedule? We, we make that determination as quickly as we can. And if you do need to have a hearing and your emergency motion uh, asks for a hearing, we will we'll get you in. We'll, we'll, we'll get you we'll get you processed either by way of a telephone or video conference. Um, let's see. I want to just check other questions. I suppose my my fellow panelists are doing that as well. Is that right? Uh, Judge Palmeyer? Yes. Uh, one question that was asked um, is uh, obviously a number of matters has, have been stayed uh, over the next couple of months, including civil jury trials. Uh, is there any sort of thought of how those cases being stayed or postponed until later of the in, in the year will affect those cases that are currently already scheduled uh, for later this year? I think that's probably a matter that it will be handled on a judge specific basis. But my my sense would be that cases where parties are ready to go and we have the time available, we're likely to just adhere to the schedule that's been set and squeeze the things that got delayed, you know, in, into other space. Uh, on the other hand, if something that was set to go in March that's urgent um, is now ready and and that means we have to push some other perhaps less urgent matter off from June or July, we're likely to do that. I think you, you can expect that there's going to be some rescheduling that happens once once the once the judges are, are back in action. And I think the judges are likely to be trying to triage based on what is, you know, the most urgent or the longest standing issue and, and uh, it, or, or can be done the most efficiently. I mean, there are a variety of things, ways to look at this. In general, I think we are going to have to prioritize our criminal calendar. I don't, I don't see a way around that. And uh, Judge Dow mentioned we've got a, a handful of people who are have been in, in, in custody and are nearing the end of what would otherwise be their, their sentence. And, and people that are that are facing a short sentencing date in some in some cases are really close to what otherwise would be released. And not only because in, on a general basis it's never proper for someone to overserve, but now in a specific context where People who are in institutions are frightened because of the possibility of the enhanced possibility of infection. It's all the more important that we be sensitive to that concern and move as quickly as we can in a situation where somebody is eligible for release, that we get those people in, get them sentenced, get them processed, and, and, and send them home if we can. Uh, another question had to do with, obviously, you have the um, amended general order. Uh, is there any... Um, views as to whether or not individual judges can uh, set schedules that would be different uh, than what's set forth in the uh, in the um, amended general order for example having deadlines that would be in the intervening period um, judge Dow do you want to maybe take a crack at that yeah I think doesn't the general order say that judges can uh, alter the deadlines if they want I think it says that um, and I would expect as time goes on, that may be more frequent. Um, but again, I told you my approach to it, which is at least for the duration of the um, uh, the social distancing and the the in the peak time for this, we hope, uh, is that I'm going to stick to the rules unless people agree, um, and sometimes they will. But I, I think that the general order contemplates that individual judges can can alter those. Um, and maybe I just have to go back and look at it. Maybe Tom knows the answer off the top. Oh, here, the presiding judge on a on a case by case and for good cause may extend, shorten, or revoke the 21 day extension or the 28 ex day extension. So yeah, that, that could happen. I'm not aware of it happening very much, at least now. But um, you know, as time goes on, it may happen more. Um, another question had to do, I know there are obviously emergency motions that are being heard by the court. Are there any um, evidentiary hearings that are occurring um, in light of the social distancing guidelines? And uh, if not, is the is the view that evidentiary hearings and, and even in emergency matters are sort of um, not likely to occur, at least in person? 
Okay, let, let me let me tell you that we, we what we've done on video conferencing has in many instances been criminal cases. So for example, initial appearances, arraignments, detention hearings. We've been handling those by way of video conference. In a detention hearing, sometimes testimony is necessary. I've had hearings where individuals who might be a third party custodian have been in the courtroom and have given testimony about their ability to monitor or supervise uh, uh, someone on release. Individuals can be heard over the video conference by, you know, for evidence. There have also been some civil cases, for example, uh, cases in, uh, in which people have sought TROs in business, in business disputes. Um, Judge Dow has handled a very large case, is handling a very large case involving prisoners at, at Stateville. And Judge Kennelly has been handling a very large case involving uh, in, in detainees at Cook County Jail. To the extent that there may have been evidentiary proceedings in, in those cases, I'm not on top of that. So perhaps Judge Dow can tell us whether he's had to hear evidence in his case or whether he is aware of what has happened in, in other instances where evidence is necessary. So uh, in, in, in the IDOC cases, um, I did not hear any evidence, although plenty of it was submitted by affidavit. Um, and I also have a separate Stateville case where I had the lawyers on the phone a couple times, but not with any live evidence. I think Judge Kennelly, and, and, and Tom, you probably would know the answer to this. I think Judge Kennelly either has had or may be having um, some sort of um, evidentiary, and, and I'm not sure if it's on the paper or live, in the, uh, in the Cook County Jail case, because I think there's a preliminary injunction motion that's now been filed because he, he, he resolved the, the first round as a TRO. Maybe Tom knows that, but I, I think he's certainly getting lots of affidavits. I don't know if there's anything live on that. Maybe, Tom, you know? He's had uh, the affidavits and uh, filed. He's had uh, a few. Um, he had one um, session that went about two hours with the attorneys and another session that went about an hour. Um, but most of it was done by affidavit. Okay, thanks. Um, that that was my understanding as well. I have um, the, the the matters that I've had, other than criminal cases, have been matters where, in in general, the affidavits or sub written submissions are all I need to make a determination. But but if there were if there were instances in which if evidence was necessary, I could imagine circumstances in which we bring witnesses in. I, I can imagine that happening. I, you know, again, I'm 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 very sensitive to the governor's order and, and to the need for social distancing. I think that even even so, if there were an emergency that requires evidence, we could accommodate that. Uh, one of the other questions, I mean, obviously in um, in the Northern District, a topic of conversation all over the past couple of years has been the um, a mandatory additional discover, uh, disclosures um, pilot program and the dates that are set forth in that order. Uh, what's the interplay between that and, for example, the deadlines uh, in the amended general order? In other words, is there any sort of extension automatically with respect to the the mandatory initial discovery po program? My understanding is the date set by the mandatory in initial discovery protocol would be extended by the same amount of time that all the other dates would be extended by order because those, there was no carve out for the MIDP mm -hmm. deadlines. The MIDP experiment, I believe, is ending in June of, of 2020. That's correct. Um, in other words, it, we're, we're nearing the end of that program in any event, but my understanding is that the deadlines will be extended by, 20, by the same 21 days. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I should also say um, on the MIDP, um, the District of Arizona, which is the only other district that's been doing this, I just had an email from Judge Campbell, who's uh, in addition to being a judge in that district, is the chair of the standing committee. And apparently yesterday they had a judges meeting and they voted not to extend the MIDP past the three-year pilot. Um, I uh, suspect that our district will do the same. Um, so I think that the MIDP, there, as of June first in our district, May 1st in Arizona, my guess is that that will be the end of the pilot. And I think each judge who's opted into the pilot is, is basically set the rule for um, compliance with it, and therefore it would fall within 
uh, a deadline set by the court under the general order. So I think that's that's right. Uh, one of the questions, and I think this was sort of touched upon in some of the earlier answers, but just wanted to flag it, um, is, you know, for criminal matters, has the court taken changes of pleas or, or performed uh, uh, sentencing remotely? We have not. I don't believe we've taken any changes of plea. Here's what we've done. As I said, we've, we've, we've handled arraignments, we've handled detention hearings, we've handled initial appearances, we've handled bond review, we've, we've ha had a number of motions filed by people who are seeking, you know, already been detained but are seeking release, or we've had motions for modification of, of release conditions. That, that has, has been done. With respect to sentencing, it's very difficult because the number of people who have to be involved uh, are large. We have to have, as, as you know, both the prosecutor, defense counsel, the defendant himself or herself. Very often, uh, you know, victims are entitled to be heard at those hearings. Um, very often, uh, their character witnesses will want to be heard. But there's also the, you know, in addition, the, the problem in many instances of an interpreter. So it becomes very complicated with respect to our bandwidth to do that. Could we do it in an absolute necessity? Perhaps, but we would we would we generally try in, in a situation um, of sentencing to to handle it in some way that would not require video conference sentencing or or telephonic sentencing. One possibility, for example, if somebody has completely has really served out what was is likely to be the sentence, would be we might consider release on conditions with a sentencing date later. That's something we could consider. But um, it generally, it, it, it can be done. It's not, it, it doesn't, it's not very smooth. And if we can possibly, you know, do a sentencing live with a genuine op opportunity for allocution and the like, that would be our vast preference. I, I don't know, is either one of you, uh, Mr. Brutner or Judge Dow, want to comment on that? No, we've only done one sentencing via video. So just to clarify that. Um, and I guess one uh, final question, um, and it has to do with matters that might be time sensitive but not uh, satisfy the criteria for emergency motions under the local rules. The question is, how should a litigate go about getting a motion heard or ruled upon? Do they contact the courtroom deputy? What is the process uh, for that? As if you're if you're filing things in your dockets, you know, you're filing case documents and you're or filing motions in, in the docket. The, the judge will see that. The courtroom deputy will see it. The court and and the judge may very well you know set a briefing schedule or set a time. If you want it heard in court, then you need to notify the emergency judges, and you do that by way of filing in that docket 20 CV 1792. And people have done this. And by the way, you know, the, the standard of, for emergency, obviously, you know, Judge uh, uh, Tom Bruton mentioned what that is. But we recognize that there are some urgent matters, you know, a, a, an agreement with respect to a, you know, a distribution of funds or something that could be that needs to happen right away. If you're not able to get the attention of the presiding judge for whatever reason, you can certainly file that in the emergency docket and we'll take care of it. Um, I think we've been pretty pretty much pretty much uh timely on those motions and and they have not they have they have not gathered a lot of moss while they're sitting in that docket we've been able to move move on them pretty quickly so if there is something that that requires some urgent action that's what you should do file it in that docket we'll take a look we'll determine whether or not the emergency judge needs to handle it or whether we need to make sure that to get the attention of the of the presiding judge who for whatever reason may not have seen it when it came in great uh, well, Judge Palmeyer, Judge Dow, and, and Mr. Bruton, we really do um, appreciate uh, your time in providing guidance to uh, members of the Chicago uh, legal community, uh, and we also really appreciate uh, you making sure that the wills of justice continue to move forward, even though we are dealing with you know very significant and challenging issues relating to the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So thank you for, uh, for, for participating, and thank you for all that you do. At this point, we'll turn well, it back over to Thank you, and be best wishes you. to everybody. Yep. And thank you very much, panelists. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's webinar, and we'd like to thank you all for attending. Have a great day, and you may now disconnect.